Almighty God, it is through your resurrected Son, Jesus Christ, that we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and have the confidence to come before you today with our praises and prayers. Grant that we may eagerly hear your word and worship you with our whole hearts and minds. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we follow the order of service as printed in your worship folder. And we begin our spring mission festival service today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What is the purpose of a mission festival? What is the mission of the church? What is your mission? Today's service is a happy occasion. We are reminded that it is our joy that Jesus, the risen Savior, has called us and sent us to be his messengers and witnesses to all, to share the good news with the world. rise as we come before the Holy God, realizing that we are sinful and that we daily need his forgiveness. Let us therefore confess and pray. Dear Father in heaven, you are mighty in all that you do and say. You have shown your unfailing love to us, even though we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We worship and adore you because you have sacrificed your only beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, for the full payment and forgiveness of all our sins. As sinful human beings, we often fail to share your word and have often been poor examples as your dear children. Forgive us, Lord, for these offenses and give us the courage and strength to boldly confess and glorify your name and your truth to all. Let us walk before you as a light to this dark world. All this we confess and pray in the name of your Son, our risen and eternal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Upon this your confession of your sins, 
by the promise and authority of Christ our Savior, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. The chapter we are looking at this morning as a chapter to remember is Matthew chapter 28. And you have it printed there and you may follow along as I read. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now we join in responsively singing the psalm verses on the next page.
please rise as we confess our faith together this morning in the words of Luther's explanation to the third article. And you will find that printed on the top of the next page. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in true faith in the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all sins to me and all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give to me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. You may be seated as we sing the next hymn, 726, and that is found in the Tan Worship Supplement. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
The verses that we consider from our chapter to remember this morning as a basis of our reflection is the last five verses from Matthew 28. I read again verses 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You are probably not surprised to hear these words this morning as part of our mission festival. No doubt you can recite some of these verses from memory. It is one of the places that Jesus tells us what our mission is, what the mission of his church is. Jesus says in verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Mark records Jesus' words of this commission as this, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What is it that we are to preach and teach? Well, that Jesus suffered and died for the sins of the world and rose from the dead as the first part of Matthew 28 recounts for us. And the resurrection that we celebrated two weeks ago on Easter. Well, when we consider this, consider the mission that God has given us here, it seems that we have an impossible mission with an unbelievable message. But don't let that stop you. Because the almighty God goes with you on your mission. And the power of the almighty God is in your message and your method. Jesus tells us, his disciples, to go and make disciples of all the nations, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone, to every creature. That seems to be a very tall order. When you think about that, when you think about reaching out, sharing what God has done, think about evangeliz evangelism, what is your response? Do you think, well, I don't know what to say? or I don't think I can do it. Well, if you ever have those thoughts, you're not alone. In fact, you are in good company. When God called Moses to go deliver his people from slavery in Egypt in Exodus chapters three and four, do you remember what his response was? He first said, who am I to go to the Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Then after asking, who should I say sent me? If they asked me what your name is, he said, he objected, well, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? And then he said, in essence, well, I can't speak well. I am slow of speech and tongue. And finally, Lord, send someone else. Well, does any of that sound familiar? I think we can all relate to these objections or excuses. Jeremiah, when God called him to bring his message to the people, he said, I do not know how to speak. It seems like a common theme. For I'm only a youth. But how did God reply? Do not say I am only a youth for to for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And that's the same thing God said to Moses, and the same thing that God says to you this morning in Matthew chapter 28. Look at verse 18. When Jesus came to them, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then again at the end of verse 20, and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. 
Too often we just focus on verse 19 and the first part of verse 20 and forget the context of our mission, something that we shouldn't do. We need to remember the context here. Verse 19 starts out with a therefore, and that shows us that the reason we can go and make disciples of all nations is because that all authority has been given to Jesus in heaven and on earth. Now, when we read in the Bible that something has been given to Jesus, it's important to remember that that refers to that thing being given to Jesus' human nature. Jesus was both God and man. And as God, Jesus always had all authority in heaven and on earth. But when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that power and authority that Jesus' divine side had was given to his human nature through that union with the divine. Now you may be thinking that sounds like something you studied in seminary, and it is. But what practical purpose does it have? What good is this thought? Well, it has a very important and useful application. As we read in Hebrews chapter 2, We're told, therefore, he, that's Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus, because of his human nature, has experienced all the doubts the weaknesses and temptations that we experience. And because his human nature was raised and has been given all authority and power in heaven and on earth, not only can Jesus sympathize with all the things that we go through, but also has the power to help us. Hebrews chapter 4 further explains this when it says we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was in every respect tempted as we are, yet without sin. And it goes on to explain, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus knows what it's like. Jesus knows what it's like to be you. Are you afraid that people won't believe you or listen to you when you try to share with them what God has done for them? Jesus knows what that is like. We are told that Jesus came to his own and his own people did not receive him. His brothers didn't believe in him. In fact, they made fun of him at times. And even his disciples failed to understand time and again, as we see, failed to understand what he said or even believe in him themselves. And we see that here this morning in verses 16 and 17. When the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. This was the 11 disciples. Only 11 because Judas was no longer with them. But these were the disciples that spent the past three years hearing the very word of God from the mouth of God. And there was Jesus, risen from the dead, standing right before them. And yet they doubted. Can you believe that? And Jesus knows what it's like to be despised and rejected. He was despised and rejected by men. And Jesus told his disciples, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So we shouldn't be surprised when we are despised and rejected as well, for they first despised and rejected Jesus himself. But that's where the last part of verse 20 comes in where Jesus tells us who has received all power and authority. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
Now the word that is translated surely here literally means behold. And its purpose is to cause us to look and consider what is being said. A paraphrase of what Jesus is saying here may be, I know what I'm telling you to do sounds like a lot of work, sounds impossible, but look, I am with you even to the end of the age. And this verse shows us that what Jesus tells us to do was not just for the 11 disciples, as they are no longer here on earth. But Jesus' words here are spoken and promised to be with his believers throughout all generations to the very end of the age. So we know that these words are spoken to us as well. From our standpoint, this mission seems impossible, but the Almighty God goes with us and gives us the power to be his witnesses and to carry out his mission. Earlier in the service, we sang verse two of hymn 496, which says, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus, you can say he died for all. I've always kind of stumbled over that verse because I'm not sure that even Paul would say that he could preach like Paul. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter two. And I, this is Paul speaking, when I came to you brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. And my speech and my message were not with persuasive words of wisdom. I think we can all relate to weakness, fear, and much trembling that Paul talks about here. Remember, this is Paul telling how he proclaimed the message. And he goes on. My speech and my message were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that's the key, the power of God. It isn't up to us to carry out this mission in our own power, in our own strength or abilities. We simply can't. As Paul later said in 2 Corinthians chapter three, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Paul didn't rely on his own abilities, but on the spirit's power and on God to make him sufficient for his ministry. In the same way, we rely upon the power of God to make us sufficient as ministers of this new covenant. Consider Peter. What did Peter do on Good Friday? Well, he denied three times even knowing Jesus. But then, just over seven weeks later, we see him on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, boldly proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. How did he go from denying to a servant girl at the door and just a handful of people around a fire that he knew Jesus, saying, I swear I don't know that man, to just a little over seven weeks later, standing up before thousands and saying, Jesus, whom you crucified, God has raised and made Lord. Well, he didn't go to a Dale Carnegie leadership seminar or attend an intensive course in evangelism methodology, but he received power when the Holy Spirit came upon him just as Jesus had promised. Power to be Jesus' witness to the ends of the earth. And you have received that same spirit in baptism. And that is exactly what Peter promised on that day. When the people were cut to the heart by what Peter said, they asked him, what should we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And this brings us to the second reason that we shouldn't let the seeming impossibility of our mission stop us. The power of the Almighty God is in our message and in our method. The message we are sent to proclaim is really one that is foolish to the world. Jesus rose from the dead? Really? We already saw how even some of the disciples didn't believe it, even though Jesus was there standing right in front of them. But how many people have you seen come back from the dead? That's not something we normally experience, and in fact, science would probably say it's impossible. The dead stay dead. So how can you say that Jesus was raised from the dead? And when we talk about our relationship to God, man naturally thinks that one must do something to earn God's favor, or must do something to appease God to make up for any bad things that one has done. And in addition, man wants to think that we really aren't all that bad, that we are good enough to earn our way into heaven. The idea that we all have sinned and fallen way short of that perfection that God requires, and therefore we deserve only eternal punishment in hell, is not a message that many people want to hear. And the idea that all of our sins and failings have been paid for by someone else, by Jesus' innocent death in our place, and that Jesus' perfect life, his active obedience to every commandment of God is now considered as our own so that we are viewed as perfect by God makes no sense to the carnal earthly mind. I remember a few years ago sharing this with a gentleman, telling him that Jesus has paid for all of our sins. There's nothing left for us to do to try to earn God's favor because Jesus did it all. It is finished, he said, from the cross. And this gentleman told me, I don't want something that I haven't had a part in. What do you say to that? We didn't have time to sit down then and for me to try to convince him otherwise, but that wouldn't have worked anyway. What are we called to do? We're called to be Jesus' witnesses. And if you think about a courtroom, what does a witness do? They're called to testify to share what they have seen, what they know, and what they've experienced. It's not their job to try to argue the case and convince the jury. But how often do we feel that we need to be God's defense attorneys? Have you ever, after talking to someone and seemingly getting nowhere, think later, oh, if I'd only thought of saying this or that, it would have made a difference, and maybe convinced that person that Jesus did die for their sins. Well, that's the same thought, that it's something that we can do to convince them. But it isn't up to you or me. We cannot argue someone into the kingdom of God. Bible is clear, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And that should be a relief, that it isn't up to us. The same Holy Spirit that works in you to give you the desire and the ability and the power to carry out your mission works through your message. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convince the people and bring them to faith. The, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come and convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And as Paul put it, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So the power is in God's word, not in us. And this was illustrated so vividly to me, one mission helper trip to India. As was our custom, we'd go out to various churches, different, a different church each day in the evening, and give a vacation Bible school presentation talking about the basic teachings of the Bible. We'd gone to this one church that was fairly small, a brick, a 
uh, Cinderblock Church, there wasn't enough room inside for all the kids that came. So we headed outside in the courtyard that was surrounded by this waist-high stone fence, and they all sat on mats below as we presented the basic teaching of creation and the fall into sin and the flood, the coming of Jesus, the promise of Jesus, some miracles that Jesus did, and his death and resurrection to bring salvation to the world. And after we were done, as typically happens over in India, and I think also probably Nepal, the attendees came up and lined up in front of each of the mission helper trip, mission helpers to have us pray for them, which we did. And we got done, and I sat down up on the porch of the church with Jody Benjamin, who is the head of the Church of the Lutheran Confession in India. And I was kind of relieved that the day was done. It had been a long day. It was late in the evening. And all of a sudden, this Indian woman appears before me. And Jody leans over and says, brother, she wants you to pray for her. So I stand up, maybe a little reluctantly, and pray for her. I, I get done, sit back down, and she disappears. And Jody says, that woman was a Hindu. I was like, oh, so she's a Hindu woman from the neighborhood who started coming to this church, came to faith. And he said, no, no. She was a Hindu woman that was walking by, heard you guys talking, stopped out in front of the gate, and listened to what you said. And I was blown away. Because I know that it wasn't anything that I had said that God had used to move her heart, because she didn't understand a word of English. It wasn't my eloquence, but it was the word of God that we shared that Jyoti Benjamin translated into Telugu that the Spirit used to move her heart to come into this Christian church, which she probably had walked by and never even thought, gave a second thought, but moved her to come in and ask me to pray for her. God's word is living and active. That's why teaching is one of the methods that Jesus gives us here in which to carry out our mission, to make disciples, to teach them, to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us. The word obey here in the original is actually a much broader term. It literally means to keep or to treasure. So it not only means to follow what God has said, but to hold on to it, to trust in it, to all that God has said, including the promises. And the second method, as we've been talking about, that we see here is baptism in verse 19. We're told to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. As God said through Peter on Pentecost, in baptism we receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Luther summarized very well what the Bible teaches about baptism in his small catechism with these words. Baptism works the forgiveness of sins, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe, as the words and promises of God declare. The world, and maybe even sometimes we, when we look at this simple pouring of water on someone's head, may ask, how can water do such great things? The water doesn't actually do anything. It's the the power is in God's word, which is in and with the water, and in faith, which trusts the word of God, which is in the water. Without the word of God, it is just plain water, and there is no baptism. But with the word of God, it really is baptism. That is a gracious water of life and the washing of rebirth through the Holy Spirit. As we're told in Titus 3, according to his mercy, he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. You have called your pastor to baptize on your behalf so that things are done orderly within the church. So you may never have the opportunity to baptize someone yourself, but you are carrying out this part of the mission by calling and supporting your pastor. And the fact that Jesus points to baptism, the simple pouring of water, which seemingly does nothing, shows us that the power is not in what we do. It's not found in ourselves, but it is God himself who goes with us and gives us his word and gives us his power through 
the word. As we've been talking about this mission that God has given us, you may have thought of times when you have failed to take advantage of the opportunities that God has given you. Times when you've let an opportunity go by to share with someone what God has done for them. I know I can think of many examples where I could have said something, but I didn't. It's important to remember that the message that we share is also for us. Because of our sinful nature, which clings to us while we are here on earth, we do fail and fall short of what God wants us to do. But that same forgiveness which Jesus tells us to go and to proclaim for others is for us as well. Jesus died to pay for the sins of the world, and that includes your sins as well. His blood cleanses you from all unrighteousness. You are forgiven and have a place in heaven. We seek to carry out the mission that Jesus gives us here, not so that we can get into heaven, but because we already have a place in paradise. We're sharing what we already have. Free salvation through the perfect life, innocent death, and Jesus' resurrection. So when we look at how much we could be doing and think of the reception that we often get from the world, it seems we have an impossible mission with an unbelievable message. But don't let that stop you. Jesus, who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, goes with you. And the power of Almighty God is in the message and the method that he gives you. So may we always respond as Isaiah did. Here I am. Send me. Amen. Please rise. Now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Please be seated for our next hymn, 205, found in the red hymnal.
Please rise. This morning we have a special prayer request for Gloria Jacobs, who recently went to St. Agnes Hospital with a virus. She is improving and would like us to keep her in our prayers as she recovers. But because of the virus, she would uh, prefer that no one come and visit her at this time. So we join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for raising your son and saving us through your grace so that we may come before you this morning and bring you our prayers and petitions. We pray especially for Gloria Jacobs that you would be with her as she recovers, continue to speed her recovery, and encourage her and strengthen her faith. Help us to remember her in our prayers. Our Savior Jesus Christ, we are thankful for the great love you have, with which you have loved us in sacrificing yourself for our sins. We are thankful, too, for the gift of faith by which we accept and make your redemptive work our own. Lord, it is your gracious will that none should perish. Therefore, give to each of us a love for souls that will cause us to seek out your lost sheep among the people we know and meet. Help us to tell them of the sacrifice your love made for their sins. Make us your devout and able messengers of the gospel by filling us with your Holy Spirit. Through the same Spirit, cause the words of salvation which we offer to others to be accepted into their hearts by faith, that they too may know the joy and gladness that fills our souls. May we never become disheartened in our efforts to speak the gospel to others, nor be ashamed to declare and defend your name. Help us recognize and seize every opportunity to testify of the only way to salvation, which is through your cross. Destroy the power of every evil force which works against the gospel, and remove every hindrance to the swift movement of salvation's message in the world. Keep us, help us see our personal responsibility to support the gospel work done by our missionaries wherever they labor. Give us generous hearts to pour out abundantly of our earthly means for their support, and remind us to pray diligently for your blessings on their message. We must confess that our fearful and timid natures have often made us reluctant to speak the wonders of your salvation to others. 
How prone we are to make excuses for remaining silent. Talents which you have given us have often remained untested and unused in the work of your kingdom. Our earthly treasures have largely remained uninvested in our church's mission endeavors. Forgive these sins of neglect and through the Spirit supply whatever courage and zeal, whatever love and abilities we still lack to make us faithful and effectual workers in your kingdom. To the praise of your name we ask all these things. And in Jesus' name we further pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Well, good morning and welcome. I'm glad you could all come and join us today. If there are any visitors this morning, we invite you to please sign the guest book out in the entryway. There are a number of uh, announcements you have in your bulletin. I've been asked to highlight a couple of them. Uh, Tuesday, this Tuesday, May 6th, we have at 6 p.m. the mother-daughter banquet. And then next Sunday, May 11th at 10 a.m., it's a communion Sunday. And also the Seminary seniors have received, been assigned calls. I have received the call to Grand Rapids, and David Udy has received the call to Appleton. 
and I would ask for your prayers as we deliberate these calls. One announcement that did not make it into your bulletin, but there are still six tickets left for the bus trip down to the Brewers and the Yankees game. But you to, if you're interested, so there's still some available, so look into that. Again, welcome, and I thank you for having me. It's been my great pleasure to be with you this morning and bring you God's word. I wish you a very blessed week and look forward to seeing you all again sometime soon.